Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 18th, and my guest is Richard Epstein, James Parker Hall, Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, and the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Richard, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's always great to be with you, Russ. Our topic for today is the rule of law in the current uh, situation. Talk about what the rule of law is, first of all, and why it's important, and then talk uh, about what's going on right now. Um, there is a huge difference in conceptions that are brought to this particular area. Some of them are relatively minimal, and some of them turn out to be much more intensive. And let me start with the minimalist conceptions and then go up to the stronger conceptions. Um, the basic notion of the rule of law at its core is the notion that there are no extraordinary processes and that everybody is going to be subject to the same kinds of legal system sanctions in courts when they are dealing with offenses. So that essentially the rule of law under these circumstances is a kind of a parallel provision. You cannot treat me different from the way in which you treat anybody else. And the theory about the word rule is that it's designed to capture the fact that it cannot be ad hoc with respect to particular individuals. Now, this definition is one that nobody wants to deny, but nobody who's serious about the subject thinks that it's going to be sufficient to deal with the basic problem, which is how it is that you take a sovereign who would otherwise be plenary in its power and subject them to some kinds of limitations so as to allow the citizens within the realm to prosper. So the second portion of a rule of law definition is also procedural, but it has a somewhat different feel to it. Now what you start to do is to talk about the kinds of protections that you have to give to individuals before you ask them to forfeit money, property, liberty, subject them to criminal sanctions of one sort or another. And here the kind of indispensable elements associated with the rule of the law, generally speaking, are these. First of all, there's a notion that the tribunal that you're before has to be somehow or other impartially constituted so that you're not having to play with a set of loaded dice, which means that your chances of winning are going to be lower than those which you would get if you had a court which was truly disinterested. This particular element about the freedom from bias then generates a large set of concerns about the institutional arrangements for the selection of decision makers, whether they be arbitrators or judge, so as to make sure that the bias element is not going to be um, severely compromised in this sense. And so you start talking about the independence of judges, you start talking about giving them term limits or permanent appointments so that they cannot be subject to the manipulation by various kinds of political people, and you want to make sure that they don't have a connection, either family or financial, with respect to any of the parties who happen to be before them. And again, I think at some general level, there's nobody who believes in the rule of law who doesn't believe that some protection against bias is appropriate. In addition to that, there's always a very important notice function associated with the rule of law, which means, in effect, that you have to be told the nature of the charges against you. That requires that there be a statute of relative clarity so you know what the offense is, and some effort to link the statute to particular cases so that you know what particular things that you did in your life, what facts, what conduct that you engaged in, are in fact going to be the subject of the tribunal. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're left in the dark as to why it is that what you did is wrong, and you may not even know what's going on. So this notice function, in fact, is extremely important to clarify the nature of the charges against you. And then, of course, the last thing is having gotten this information, having had a tribunal, which to some extent is going to be um, neutral, the question is, can you be heard and what does that mean? And the right to be heard actually is kind of a funny word. Originally, in some sense, it meant that you only had the right to a kind of an oral hearing that you have to be able to go before the judge and to present your case in your own words, then you would ask whether or not you could call witnesses on your behalf, whether you could cross-examine the witnesses opposed to you. But all of those things, I think, are important, some of them less so, more so than others. But in addition, it comes to the question as to whether or not you could prevent written, use written testimony instead of oral testimony or in addition to it, to make sure that there's a full and complete record before the decision-maker decides to go before or against you. 
And when you're dealing with private disputes, if you have all of these advantages, the other side has to have them as well. And it's hoped that if you get rid of the intrigue on both sides, you're more likely to be faithful to whatever it is the substantive norm takes place. But in many instances, the adversary turns out to be the state. And here the problem is often more difficult because the state runs the administrative apparatus. It runs the prosecutor's office. And so the rule of law requires that there be some degree of separation between the two of them so that the political forces of government cannot, in effect, encroach upon its judicial capacity. And if you look back, for example, to Montesquieu when he started to talk about the separation of powers, he did not envision, essentially, a very large role for the judiciary. But what he did assume is that it was the party that was going to hear the particular disputes which came up under the substance of law, whatever that law might be. So that's the first half of this stuff on the procedural side. Um, should I go on and now talk about the substantive end of this, I guess? Sure. Carry okay, on. well, thanks. Um, the substantive end of it is what kinds of rules do you have to have on the face of them in order to deal with the sort of fundamental fairness considerations. And here, of course, there's a weak version and a stronger version of the same kinds of principles. The weak version, for example, in effect, says that there are two sorts of strong limitations that you place on uh, the kinds of legal rules that the state can enforce. The one that's most obvious is a rule which says, in effect, what happens is we don't allow for retroactive laws. And the question of what makes the law retroactive is the subject of a lot of complicated literature and discourse, but in its simplest case, you engage in a particular act at a given time when it's legal, and then at some subsequent time, the state comes along and says, no, 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 the action that you engaged in at that past time is now illegal under current statutes, and we can punish you or fine you for things that you've done that were legal when they happened. And most people who believe in the rule of law say you can't do this because you have no notice of what's right or wrong and you cannot regulate yourself with respect to rules that have yet to be announced. And then there's a corollary to this which says, but if you know that they're going to do something terrible, then in effect you can judge that because it's foreseeable what's going to happen, to which the answer is we never, ever, ever want to give the state the ability to threaten you by announcing it will pass the law, have you cut back on your conduct, and then decide not to go through with the law at all. There's just too much gaming that takes place between the two sides so that the conception of retroactivity that matters is that you want to make something illegal, make it illegal so that people, in effect, can regulate their conduct, but never apply it retroactively to it. And the other half is more controversial, but it's the same theme. It goes back to the old equal protection notion of trying to pick out people for special punishments. So it's a rule which says that you cannot, in effect, impose special restrictions on one class of individuals that you don't impose on another. So to give you a kind of an example, suppose you have to fund improvements for a public road. And what you tell is all the people who are on the east side of the road, okay, you're on the east side of the road, you're going to have to pay a special assessment in order to cover half the cost of the road. Then you tell the people on the west side of the road, they don't have to pay a special assessment, that everything will be paid out of general tax revenues, including tax revenues collected from people on the east side of the road. And if you look at it, if the road is basically identical to the people on both sides of it, the folks on the east are paying more for the same particular benefit than the posts on the west. And if the moment you allow people to have special rules of this particular sort, it makes it very possible for you to shift income, opportunities, and favors from one individual to another, from one class of individuals to another, and wholly apart from what we think to be the substantive ideals of a system of law. That's generally thought to be something which is unattractive. So those are the two kinds of main substantive constraints that most people who believe in the rule of law are going to live with. The question is, can you go further? And I think you really have to go somewhat further than that, because I could think of all sorts of oppressive legislation that meet every one of the requirements that we're talking about, and yet would be rejected by anybody who thinks that law ought to be an instrument for social welfare. So you could have a system, for example, which with savage generality and complete going forward quality say, look, we are now going to live in a regime in which we think it's unjust for people to earn more than $10,000 a year. And anybody who seeks to enter into a contract for that amount is going to be subject to criminal prosecution. And or we could have another law which says, you know, these rules with respect to trespass the land are totally obsolete. We think that the correct way to run things is to allow anybody to squat on anybody's land at any time for any reason. 
Well, the first of these rules ends freedom of contract, and the second of these rules ends the right to exclude, which is one of the key components of a system of private property. And yet it's prospective, it's general, it's going to be enforced by the proper kind of tribunal, and the traditional argument is, well, this is such an egregious law that it will never be passed by a democratic party or a democratic government, because everybody's going to be hurt by it. But you know, in effect, minimum wage laws have exactly those sorts of characteristics. So the way in which I think of the rule of law is that you have to blend with it a conception of how you deal with contract and property. And this is the basic notion. The definitions of property include not only the right to exclude, but the right to use and develop. And the key feature here is that all that you can demand as the owner of property from everybody else is a duty to forbear from interference. And what's so good about this as a baseline for the rule of law is that the definition of interference, don't enter my land, don't throw bombs on top of it, don't throw filth on top of it, and so forth, are clear enough that you don't have to worry about the notice function. And the restrictions that you impose on individuals are slight enough that, generally speaking, it doesn't interfere with their productive behavior. And the rules generalize very easily in that they will work as well in ancient Rome as they do in modern New York. And, in fact, all the property rules are identical in those two settings, precisely because they're all scalable. And the moment you start changing this to the modern rule, which says, well, we're going to zone you E1 so that you can build a 10-story building, and we're going to zone this other guy B2 so that he only build a two-story building on the land, you start seeing all the difficulties with special legislation coming back through the zoning system, the intrigue, the kind of thing which takes a city like New York and after 50 years of faithful administration reduces it to a situation where there's genuine crisis on the fiscal and on the real estate side of matters. And then with respect to contracts, the whole theory about contracting is that generalized duties of non-interference are not duties which allow for cooperation. And you must allow for cooperation, for otherwise there'll not be gains from trade, and there'll not be the ability to switch assets from people who don't need them to people who do. So a system of voluntary exchange meets the rule of law, so long as you can say that the buyer and the seller, or the partner and the partner, when they combine their resources do not have any greater or lesser claims against third parties than they did when they acted separately. And the theory about this is they get the joint gains, uh, the improved economic position that they have creates greater opportunities for trade for everybody else and doesn't allow people to start slipping in various kinds of controls over what everyone else does. And this is an important restraint. Look, for example, at collective bargaining statutes. What they say is you've got a bunch of workers, none of them under a rule of law system could force an employer to hire them. That would never be a property right, it would just be a matter of negotiation. If now they decide to band together, can they impose upon the employer a duty to negotiate with them in good faith towards a contract? Well, that's a question of A and B and C getting together and imposing obligations on D, which he otherwise had, never had. And so that would be flatly inconsistent with this modern version of the rule of law because it allows people who want to combine their entitlements to get claims against third parties, which they could not get exercising them individually. So that means that in the end, the most robust system of the rule of law comes up to be a relatively powerful system of classical liberalism. Let That's me, a long answer. No, it's a good answer, but let me, let me uh, ask a clarifying question and then, sure. then I want to explore something. Uh, clarifying question, you, you used the phrase, people who believe in the rule of law, and then you went on. Uh, now, I understand not everyone might accept your broadest version of it, the, la the last one you mm -hmm. gave. But are there any people who challenge the versions, the, the weaker versions, who, who argue that, that a more arbitrary uh, judiciary, a more arbitrary set of, of legal system is better? Oh, in, yes. I mean, this is one times. of the huge battles in the, of the whole New Deal period. And let me give you some of the cases where things break down. First of all, start with the last conception on retroactivity. Uh, the modern American constitutional law gives no protection against retroactivity except through something which is known as a clear statement rule. And what that means, in effect, is if you have a statute, and it doesn't specify whether it's perspective only or retroactive and perspective, a court will read it as perspective only. But if the legislature wants to make it retroactive, all it has to do is to say this statute shall retroactively apply. And it is now held with such great clarity in so many different cases, in so many different contexts, that you have no due process protection against retroactive regulations. This started with the black lung disease cases. 
where they told companies whose conduct was legal at the time that it was done that they had to fund insurance policies with respect to workers who were injured in their plans. Then they even tried to impose it on firms that didn't even hire these workers in order to keep some form of, 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 of parity between two competitive industries, and all this stuff was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. When was that? Well, the key case is a case called Turner against Usri Elkhorn, and it was decided in 1976, and it was written by Justice Marshall. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the question about whether or not you can have special assessments in ways that necessarily prejudice one party is against another, well, that's also been attacked for a very long period of time. The most famous case on this actually goes back to 1905, involving the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, and it's one of Justice Holmes' worst efforts on this stuff. And what happened is you had a road, and on one side there were a bunch of homes which benefited, or businesses, from paving this road over and improving it. And on the other side of the road there was a railroad that went parallel to the road, which was in competition with the highway. And the local Solons decided that they were going to use a front foot special assessment, so they charged the railroad for half the cost of the road, and the homeowners for half of it. And the railroad came into court and said, what do we benefit from this road? And Justice Holmes said questions of valuation are extraordinarily difficult, and so therefore he was going to sustain this special assessment on both sides. So that's one conception which essentially has been attacked. Take the question of neutrality and, and lack of bias. Um, it seems very clear that in the administrative states, one is less punctual about this than you were a traditional common law rule. So one of the standard situations is whether or not a state could decide that the party who investigates a particular case within an administrative framework can then issue a final decision on the merits after it conducts its investigation. And my view, of course, is that the mixing of the prosecutorial and the adjudicatory role are exactly the kind of thing that the rule of law is designed to guard against. And in a case, again, from the 1970s, Justice White announced this was perfectly okay by him. Um, because unless you could show actual bias, the administrative state had to take certain kinds of shortcuts. Give you another example on the same thing. If you look at the way in which the National Labor Relations Act is drafted, it says that the labor board shall have five members, three of whom are the president's party and two of whom are not. So now you have a particular political linkage to the seats, and the president gets to choose the chairman. And what this means is that getting a nomination through are absolutely a difficult task because you have to pair Republicans against Democrats. Right now on the labor board, we have only two members, one Republican and one Democrat. And the whole idea of creating specialized tribunals to deal with an issue like labor, which is so heated up between the employer and the employee, and then to have partisan political appointments to it seems to me to be just asking for trouble when it comes to how you want these things to be worked. It's much better to have a district court judge who has no particular political affiliation hear these cases. Sometimes they'll go one way, sometimes they'll go the other way. It won't be perfect, but it will be much less intensely partisan than it is under the current system. So when you even want to talk about these kinds of considerations, uh, the usual argument that you hear from people of the New Deal tradition is progressive government is big government. Big government cannot afford to be slowed down by all of these nettlesome political protections. In fact, Woodrow Wilson, who was in many cases the theoretical architect of this, writing in his book on congressional power in 1885, he announced that the whole principle of separation of powers as articulated in the original Constitution was a grievous mistake in judgment. So there is a yeah. lot of tension on all of these points not just the substantive protection points, but also the whole operation of the administrative state. You know, that's why I guess we call Woodrow Wilson a progressive, uh, a world, word I almost you always find over. myself, but I found myself putting it in quotes. Yes. Um, let's talk about the more general concept, which is, you know, you, you opened your discussion of the topic with the uh, judicial system. A as a non-legal scholar, uh, as a non-lawyer, when I think of the rule of law, I think of the opportunity to use my property and take risks and profit and and lose accordingly and that there will not be arbitrary rule of man decisions about what my returns are for that. And that that's not – that sort of falls into your broadest category. That's still classical liberal definition, but it's not the earlier definitions. The earliest definition on the rule of law was essentially – in a world without democratic processes, it was designed to restrict the arbitrary power of the king. And to some extent, the protection of private property would be part of that particular mandate. 
But well, the moment it came to more subtle forms of regulation having to do with network industries and with zoning and with environmental protection and so forth, a lot of these property definitions got battered very badly because the courts weren't particularly strong on figuring out what kinds of uses are, in fact, the ones that you can take risk and get returns for, and which of them would be off limits as being trespasses, nuisances, creation of ultra hazardous activities, destructions of fisheries, interference with electromagnetic magnetic radiation, and all the other stuff. So that the problem of working out the property system was, in fact, fairly astute. People tried to do it and had pretty good, not fabulous, but pretty good success until the 1937 revolution when the United States Supreme Court said, hey, it's not worth trying to keep these things in place anymore. Whatever the state wants to do is fine. And let me give you the key distinction of the older rules, and you can see how it plays into your discussion. Uh, the traditional version of the police power was formulated as having four heads, health, safety, uh, morals, and general welfare. The last two sound very broad, so let's just put them aside for the second and concentrate on the first two. And essentially what happened is you could always pass rules that would limit the use of property if the consequence of its use would be to create disease or contagion that would spread to somebody else. And in fact, the health and safety stuff was the kind of police power which allowed for sanitation and sewage in the last half of the 19th century, which was by and large the main driver of increased life expectancies, both in England and the United States. For the historical record, before 1850, life expectancy and in England and much of Europe, had hovered around 40 years on average for a very long period of time. Between 1900, 1850 and 1900, it all of a sudden went from 40 to 48 or so. And some people thought it was just an aberration. Until in the next 20 years, it went up in the United States from 47, 48 to around 54, at which point people realized that something very fundamental was going on. And nobody at that time wanted to stop that. But the key question on health is, can you use a health justification to override what you would call freedom of contract? And generally speaking, the answer to that question was yes. And they didn't mean by this massive intrusion, but the famous cases are, suppose you own a movie theater and you have a bunch of doors and they open to the inside. What happened is that people, in the case of fire, would desperately go to get out and they'd be crushed against the doors which they could not open. So the police power allowed the state to mandate that the owner of a facility of that sort have their doors open to the outside and not keep them locked during time when people were in the business. And that would have stopped the Triangle Waste Factory, for example, from going up in smoke and killing everybody in 1911. And these incidents, by the way, were not just industrial. They were very common throughout the early part of the 20th century. We had all sorts of boats that capsized. We had all sorts of movie theaters that went up in fire. There were just a large number of mass disasters. And, of course, we had the Titanic, if you want to remember. I mean, the, the rate of industrial accidents then was very, very high, and there was no one on the Supreme Court who said that sensible safety regulations could not be done. But the question is, what's a labor statute? And essentially, the court said, you could work about safety, but you cannot put into place those things which essentially upset the economic play of economic forces in a competitive market. And so, for example, about the same time that they made it perfectly clear that you could require various kinds of safety devices on trains, like air brakes and so forth, uh, the Supreme Court handed down a decision in a case called Lochner against New York, which said that the state could not mandate that workers work for no more than 60 hours a week or 10 hours a day. And the question is whether or not the hour statute was a health and safety regulation or whether it was a labor statute, by which we mean a deliberate effort to interfere with competitive market forces. And there was a lot of evidence in that particular case that the 60-hour statute was, in fact, a labor statute. Because what happened is that the workers, in this case called Lochner against New York, they had no complaint with their boss. But what they did is they slept on the job between their evening shift and their morning shift. And when they slept on the job, that meant that they were working necessarily more than 10 hours a day. Whereas the union bakers had two shifts, one in the evening and one in the morning. And so they could meet with the 10-hour work rule. And although the court didn't go into all the economics, this was clearly a case of a differential regulation, which was designed to advantage one competitor at the expense of another. And when the thing got a little bit clearer a couple of years later, and the question was whether or not an employer could be forced into a collective bargaining agreement with the workers, even the justices who thought, hey, that the 10-hour rules might turn out to be a safety regulation after all, went over the other way and said, no, 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 you can't do that. 
when you get to the New Deal, the distinction is no longer worth drawing. And so all of a sudden, you get the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, which allows for all sorts of wages and hour regulations having to do with minimum wages, overtime, and the rest, which is one of the worst statutes on record, and it's still very much with us today, tremendously difficult to enforce. And you get the National Labor Relations Act, which authorizes the collective bargaining, which had been struck down 30 years before. Um, So there is, in fact, a, a, a systematic effort on the part of the judicial system to figure out how it is that we identify those areas of risk in which you are entitled to seek a return and pay the consequences, and those kinds of things which were not. One of the nice things about understanding the earlier period is they were much more sophisticated than their progressive, peer, their progressive critics, who basically didn't even understand the way in which competitive markets operated and were completely keen on setting up cartels on the naive ground, whatever good for the cartel members has to be good for society, which is not generally true. That is one of the few things I think we did learn from the Great Depression, although it, we seem to be occasionally well, we're forgetting, forgetting it, it. Yeah. Uh, so I think I first saw you speak um, something like six or seven years ago. I wish it had been longer, but it was only about six or seven years ago. We were, uh, we were at the Hoover Institution, and you said something uh, whimsical. At least it was taken to be whimsical by the audience. Uh, you said something about you wondered whether there were the rule of law existed in Palo Alto, California. Oh, yes. You remember that? Speech. I do, because I thought, you know, that's a goofy thing. Of course, there's we have the rule of law. And then I started thinking, well, you know, it's kind of been dented over the last 10, 20, 50, 70 years. And I'm curious, and you took it as a serious, you made it as a serious remark. Some Everybody, I think a lot of people in the crowd chuckled, but it was not meant as, as a, it wasn't oh, comic relief. Oh, they chuckled when I said it. They didn't chuckle when I was finished. <laughs> yeah, and I wondered what your thoughts are on it today in May same of view. 2009. The same? Has it gotten any better, any worse? Um, um, I would say on the zoning issue, it's, it's sort of pretty much in steady state. Um, not appreciably worse, not appreciably better. But let me tell you what the point of this was, and then the audience can judge for itself whether or not I was being hyperbolic or sensible. What I said, in effect, is that when you start dealing with the rule of law, these notions of procedural regularity matter. And that in the United States, to the extent that we deal with criminal prosecution that results in incarceration or forfeiture, for the most part, the rule of law has held. But that when you get to a town like Palo Alto, there are often questions as to who gets to build on which particular lot. And what happens is the way the zoning board is determined and operates is that individuals have to apply on an individual basis to get the appropriate permits to build the structures that they desire. Everybody concedes, myself included, that nobody should be able to build a building which essentially is a pollution factory and throws all sorts of filth into your next-door neighbor's window. But nobody wants to spend a million dollars to choke on their own fumes, and so none of these buildings have anything to do with nuisances. They have to do with height, they have to do with setbacks, they have to do with whether or not you could lend out a room to somebody else. And what happens is the kinds of conditions that can be imposed by a zoning board with respect to new construction are essentially as varied as the legal imagination can possibly get to. And so that you can be told you can do this, but you can't be done that. And an effort to try and draw parallels to somebody else will say, well, it's a different time, a different place, a different location, and everything else. So the arbitrariness of the zoning permit system was part of it. The second part of it was actually slightly more ominous. When I was in Palo Alto in 1977, I was at the Center for Advanced Studies, and I got wind of the way in which the state and the city or the county, I can't remember whom, but one of these entities was able to acquire land. And what they do is they go over to a landowner and they say the following, look, you've got land now which is a buildable plot, and it's worth $100,000 to you. We would like to incorporate this into our particular public resort. And if you contribute it now, what you do is you get a tax deduction for $100,000. We'll verify its worth. And that will be worth, given your state and federal deduction, say $40,000. And if you don't do that, what will happen is we'll come along and we'll rezone your land. And at that particular point, it may be worth only five or $10,000 but you don't have to give it to us. So which will it be? Will you Mm -hmm. contribute the land to the county or the city, or will you basically undergo the threat of a rezoning, which will reduce it more? And most people, when (laughs) faced with those kinds of alternatives, 
generally will yield. They would rather take the tax deduction than to have the zoning. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that zoning threat is absolutely improper. This is very thuggish. But if you then go back to American constitutional law and ask whether or not when there's an undeveloped plot of land there's any strong protections against down zoning, let alone against zoning, the answer to that question is generally no. And so in my view, that kind of a situation can result in serious sorts of abuses, and that I do not think that those behaviors are consistent with the rule of law. Now, note what happens, by the way, if they try to do this in an area where you have to actually compensate people when you deprive them of their legal rights to make lawful uses of their own property. Now you want to lower the value of the land ten, from, nine, from 100 to $10,000, and the landowner sits there and he says, you know what, you can do that. All you have to do is to pay me $90,000 in compensation to make me whole. At that point, the threat becomes completely idle because the only way that they can force you to take a reduction in the value of the land is to pay you for the value that they're reducing by the restriction they're imposing upon. So that the compensation function in the just compensation law and the takings law essentially is a protection against the use of arbitrary power. And I can't tell you how many cases you read in eminent domain where, in effect, very draconian restrictions on land use value are imposed And the judicial response to all of this stuff is, it's not a government occupation of the land. Everyone knows that property means the right to exclude. It doesn't mean the right to use. It doesn't mean the right to dispose. It doesn't mean any of the things that you said it meant a couple of times, you know, a couple of minutes ago. And so, therefore, we can chase after you. So, my view is we have the rule of law with respect to the right to exclude. We do not, when these things can be exercised in that fashion, have a rule of law that deals with the rights of use and disposition of property. We are all subject to arbitrary stuff. And the Supreme Court was asked to deal with this question in a case called Lucas against South Carolina yep. Coastal Commission. Yep. And what Justice Scalia said was a kind of a compromise solution, which did fine in the particular case, but was useless generally. He said, if in fact the land use restriction wipes out the entire value of the land, we'll treat it as though it's a government occupation. And so in that particular case, what happened is the community came up with a statute which said that if your house gets blown down, you can't rebuild it. And if you have an empty plot of land, you can't build on it at all. And so without the right to develop even a single-family home, the value of a lot will plummet from basically a quarter of a million dollars at that time to 10 cents or something like that. And Justice Scalia rightly said it was a wipeout. He never asked the question, suppose we are going to let you build a house and we'll let it build at the size of 10 by 10 by 10. So now you can build something on your land, and obviously it's worth more than it was before. Is that going to be treated as different from or similar to the first case? And then you go 10 by 10 by 10, you make it a little bit bigger, you can throw in a driveway, add in a bathroom. Where is it that you get past the point of complete economic wipeout? He refused to answer that question. Uh, Basically, 15 years of Supreme Court jurisprudence has refused to answer that question. And the right answer is, if you give somebody the right to build on a house something, you know, 10 feet square, if its value goes from $250,000 down to 1000 instead of zero, you give $249,000 worth of compensation. You always keep the taking and the residual use complementary, and they have to sum up to the total value of the land. Uh, that's nothing that the Supreme Court has been prepared to do, but it's the only thing that will prevent political gamesmanship. And this does not require any modern, fangled definitions of property. The notion that somebody is taking a servitude, as it's called, by restricting your lawful uses of land goes back to Roman times. And in fact, nobody differentiates between an easement, which allows you to walk across somebody else's land, and a restrictive covenant, which allows you to stop him from building as he could ordinarily do, given the usual rights between landowners. So there's a very deep kind of gap in the property system, and local governments have run to do it. In the Lucas case, as I never stop telling my students, um, what typically happens is you see the rule about complete wipeouts, and you say, I don't want to go there. So in the middle of the case, the South Carolina folks changed their rules, and they just put in an impossible set of procedural restrictions on how you bring these cases and substantive requirements that you had to meet, which made it impossible to value your entitlement. And that gets them out of the, no compens- of the full compensation rule, and nobody but nobody knows exactly when those regulations, quote-unquote, go too far. And the too far language is not mine. That's just this Holmes' language in a case called Pennsylvania Coal against Mahan, where he said, government regulation will be regarded as a taking when it goes too far. 
And, you know, why a formulation so utterly vapid should receive such reverence and constitutional respect is yet just another one of the very vexing reasons on this area. Uh, the Supreme Court law on takings is a dreadful intellectual mess, but it's not just a matter of intellectual curiosity. Uh, the level of value destruction in this society that takes place by the arbitrariness of local land use decisions and of national land use decisions is enormous. It's enormous with respect to landmark preservation for built structures, and it's enormous with respect to habitat preservation with respect to the Endangered Species Act and similar statutes. Well, let, let me bring us beyond land, uh, and I want to mention to our listeners uh, that at least in, experimentally, uh, in an experimental mode, I am now on Twitter as EconTalker, E-C-O-N-T-A-L-K-E-R, and uh, through that service, a listener, Eli Dorado, asks – uh, he wanted to hear about your impressions of what's going on at, say, GM and Chrysler and this whole uh, spat – it's not more than a spat – this fight over bankruptcy and the bondholders, the hedge funds, and how you see that in light well, of the takings issue. This is exactly the same question. Let, let's – first of all, like everything else in this world, let's begin with a few fundamentals. And the first fundamental is that property interests can be – Possessory or non-possessory. Uh, the way in which I described the, the law of takings before under current conditions is that if the government occupies land which is yours, it's a taking. If they merely regulate it, it is not. So when you get to non-possessory interest, things start to go a little bit crazy. A mortgage is a non-possessory interest in land. It is essentially a right to say that if, in fact, you who have borrowed money from me do not repay it, I can get absolute title to the property that's used to secure the debt, use that to pay off the debt, my expenses and my interest, and if there's anything left over, it goes to you. Otherwise, essentially, you're wiped out. So mortgage is a property interest. The most famous aphorism in takings law on the pro-property protection side actually arose in a mortgage case back in 1960, a case called Armstrong against the United States. And what happened was there was a material man, that is somebody who supplied various kinds of services to help build or repair a ship. And this material man had done some work on a ship that was owned by the United States. And he did it for a contractor. And the contractor didn't pay him. The rule in every jurisdiction is a material man can put a lien on the property so that if the property is worth more than the lien, the owner of the property has to essentially pay off the material man before he's free to go. So these liens, in effect, are mortgages. And the United States didn't want to pay this particular lien, so they did the only dishonorable thing they could think of. They literally took the book boat out of main waters and sent them into international waters, and the lien did not attach outside the territorial waters of Maine. <laughs> Oh, and so the guy comes and he says, you know, you took my property, my lien, and you really have to pay me, and you could afford to do so. And Justice Black, for a majority but not a unanimous decision, said, look, it's very clear who ought to be paying for the repairs of the ship. This ship is bent for the benefit of us all. We all ought to pay for it through our tax dollars, and the United States should not be allowed to take this ship into international lawyers and dump the lien. So it required them to basically treat this guy as though he was a general creditor and then pay him off his full value. And this was a way of saying that liens, in fact, are property. Now, once you understand that they're property, it turns out that the notion of a lien that's absolutely critical is that of called priority. And what it means, in effect, is that our financial institutions now are sufficiently sophisticated that you can, through a variety of arrangements, put multiple liens on property. If you've got three material men on the same projects, their priorities are in parity. No one gets an advance of another, unless there's a statute which says that the priority is organized in terms of first to file. And some statutes do require that kind of complicated rule. But when you lend money to somebody, there's a first mortgage and there's a second mortgage, for example, in the simplest case. And the guy who basically lends you the big money to build, build your house at 80%, he gets a first claim and somebody else gives you 10% and they get a second mortgage. And the rule on all of this stuff is that the first mortgagee has to be paid off in full before the second mortgagee gets a dime. Since the interest is registered and the value of the property is publicly observable to the extent that anybody can know it, the second mortgagee can calculate his interest rate and the size of his loan to take into account the prior lien. And then third on the list is the holder of the equity, such that if the two mortgages are paid off in sequence, he gets what's ever left over. 
And the fundamental rule of bankruptcy with respect to these various liens is that the world will fall into chaos if the priority system that exists outside of bankruptcy is disrespected inside of bankruptcy. Because then the second mortgage becomes first, the first mortgage becomes second, the equity holder gets paid before the mortgages get paid, and all of the calculations based on risk and reward are critical about the sequence of payment, and if bankruptcy wrecks those things, essentially it destroys credit markets. Now, in order to put this in takings terms, the correct analysis says, hey, we don't care about the rules on physical possession as applied to land use here. What we have to do is to understand that the absolute priority rule is such that if the second mortgagee is promoted over the first mortgagee, it's a taking to the extent that the guy who had the first position has lost value with respect to his security. And if an unsecured creditor jumps over all, both of these guys, that's also a taking. Well, that's exactly what happened in the Chrysler bankruptcy and will happen when General Motors finally goes its appointed path. What happened is we know who had the first priority on these cases. It was the various bondholders who lent money on secured credit. And a bond is essentially an obligation to pay a fixed amount of money, typically, which is secured by a lien on the various assets of a corporation. Sometimes it's a specific piece of land. Often it may be what they call a floating lien, so that all the assets of the company, the inventory and so forth, that comes in and out, if there's ever a bankruptcy or a foreclosure, the lien freezes at the moment of the foreclosure, and whatever property's in the till goes to this guy first and to the second mortgagee second. And what made the bankruptcy situation in Chrysler so crazy is that the pension funds and the health funds for the unions were unsecured creditors which meant, in effect, that they had no protection against specific assets. And you had to do it that way because you could never get outside loans if these guys as unsecured creditors could gobble up a huge amount of the equity of the business. When it got to the Treasury Department, they violated the rule of law in the strict sense. That is, instead of letting this thing go through the ordinary rules in bankruptcy court, where we know exactly what's going to happen, what they said is, we're going to work this kind of an arrangement and present the deal to the bankruptcy court. And what the government did, which I think is, again, completely inappropriate, is they said, we're going to put money on the table, and we're going to tell the secured creditors, unless they fold their hands, um, we're not going to let this thing go through. And so they basically threatened them, including threatening people who had taken TARP funds with unspecified forms of retaliation, right? It starts to look quite ugly. You have to back off on your claims, so that by the time the dust settled and you went into bankruptcy, what happened was, as best I can tell, the secured creditors got 10 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar. Nobody's quite sure. And the pension fan funds for the UAW, they got a lot more money. And essentially, you know it's wrong. You don't know exactly how much this company is worth, but it's got to be owned by the secured creditors before the pension plans get anything. But in this political world, you can force it this way, and there was so much government pressure that what happened is some of the secured creditors actually relented for fear of retaliation. And this will now be treated as though it was a voluntary waiver of a known right, and so therefore you can't assert your priority. My view is nobody gives up rights like this unless somebody's beating them over the head. And the government, in effect, surely did this. There's no rational reason why people would ever accept the deal that rellinquishes a priority of this sort unless they're being threatened with a greater calamity from the outside. Do you think... So that do you think it'll be challenged in court? I know it will be challenged by somebody. The problem, of course, when you have a situation where the government is both regulator on the one hand and defendant on the other, is people are going to be a bit uneasy about challenging them if the government can say, oh, you can challenge this mortgage. By the way, when you're going to get this permit to do that, remember who's looking at you, right? Sure. And, you know, the president made, I thought, it was, you know, Glenn Holland Reynolds said it this morning in the Wall Street Journal, the sort of joke when he was at the Arizona State saying, hey, you know, if you disagree with us, we could always tax audit you. No, that's, that's not funny. Not funny. And the reason it's not funny is because the government they has do. so many <laughs> regulatory clubs over so many people that you can never, ever say that any deal that you enter into them is free of coercion. The definition of coercion does not just mean beating people up under the head. It is clearly a case of coercion to tell somebody, look, I got two pieces of your property. You could decide which of them you'd like to have back, and I'll keep the other. Right? That's a form of coercion, and that's what's happening. People are told that they have their right to their bankruptcy lien or their right to some fair process in a regulatory setting, but they can't have both. And, and so what you see here is a really muscular version 
of government aggression, which is not becoming. I mean, Mr. Obama should understand the gravity of what he does, but unfortunately, he's so unschooled with respect to why private property matters or how bankruptcy starts to work that I don't think he or his secretary or his treasury or maybe even somebody as sophisticated as Lawrence Summers understands the implicit threat to the entire system of property rights and the system of credit. That is, when you're dealing with threats under the eminent domain or takings clause, there are multiple sorts. The zoning laws are, of course, threats with respect to land use. But equally important in many cases are respects to uh, credit dispositions associated with the law of mortgages, and that's what we're seeing erode in this particular situation. Previous to these cases, for the most part, the level of protection of liens against property through bankruptcy and otherwise was stronger than the protection of land use rights. And now we see that part of the system perhaps slipping under the sea, never to return again. And it was similar, of course, to the nullification of the contracts with respect to AIG. I mean, you know, people called me up and they said, you know, we've been given this ultimatum that we have to sign these waivers by tomorrow or else. Actually, it was on a Friday afternoon to be signed by a Monday. And don't bother to see a lawyer in the interim unless it's ours because he's not going to do you any good. Which I case, mean, there's amazing that, amount of muscle that's that? going on there, and I think people have to speak up against it. This is not the way in which you could run a society to have the people who are in charge of prosecution, the people who appoint the judges, to start putting their heavy weight against individuals who have valid claims which they would rather see extinguished. What was the issue with AIG? At? AIG was the question of compensation for key oh, for employees. The, for the bonuses, yeah. Well, actually, all the people at AIG, when you talk to them, they don't like the word bonus. And let me well, it's explain. part of their regular compensation. It's different yes, I mean, business it's the deferred compensation. The reason is when you use the word bonus, the common understanding of that, this is an extra reward for a very good year. You know, we're giving you a bonus at the end of the year. But what happens in this industry is that the performance measures are very difficult to deal with and the compensation metrics are very hard, that there is both for tax reasons, which are unwise, and for business reasons, which are wise, a tendency to give deferred compensation to individuals and the moment you defer it, you have to compensate them for the time. And the moment you defer it contingent upon good performance, you have to give them more money to, because they take the risk of failure. And all of these deals have been worked out by the guy, Liddy, who is the head of this company. And then once the Treasury gets on it, they decide they don't like the arrangement because it's not going to play well in Peoria, and they want them to do something about it. Now, my view about a president and the Secretary of Treasury is what they ought to do is to tell people, we have $200 million that we put into this company, a mistake, I might add. Um, and if we're going to do that, we have to ensure that it's protected. No responsible owner of any particular firm would ever try to cheat on compensation where in effect two hundred million dollars relative to two hundred billion dollars is a you know one part in ten thousand or whatever it is. It just doesn't make any sense to engage in that sort of behavior. And that's what they should say instead of saying we're gonna get their scalps and put it up on the top of the highest tree so that everybody out there can understand that we're on their side. Well you um, can't you can't have an owner who um is a regulator. Yeah, and who is a uh, the whole idea of, of the government getting a share in these enterprises as some sort of quid pro quo for the money put in, as we would do in an individual case, right? Yeah. It's such a strange thing because the interest, so-called interest of the owner is is mitigated through politics in a way that's not useful for capital allocation. Yeah, it's not mitigated. It's mediated through yeah. politics. Look, here's a simple test to show the wisdom of that. You talk about the NFL, and there was a famous case where the question is whether or not the Oakland Raiders could condemn the team in order to prevent it from moving to Los Angeles. That was one of the serious issues. And you looked at the NFL charter, and what they say is that no public entity could ever be a member of our league because they understood exactly what would happen if you start having public bodies in these leagues. You can never keep anything confidentiality because of all the sunshine laws. And any time you did something that a team didn't like, it would then dis threaten you with various kinds of regulations on taxes, land use regulation, or whatever. And so you have to keep the quick separation. And if you wanted to have situations where the government put money into it, what you'd want to do is to create an independent fund with its own board, put the money into that board, and give it the discretion on which funds companies to invest in and why, which is not reviewable by the political branches of government.
um, is the correct way to do this if you're going to do it at all. And the truth about the matter, one of the great virtues of the bankruptcy system is that there is no infusion of public cash, yeah. which leads to all sorts of distortions in these particular cases. So that what would have happened if they had done this thing correctly, and this is as much George Bush as it is Barack Obama, is at the first sign of trouble, what the federal government does is says, we have a lockbox, but we're not opening it. You guys go into bankruptcy. And at that particular point, all contracts are subject to renegotiation because we have a failed enterprise. And now not the question, not the sanctity of contract, it's the relative priority of contract. And the secured guys come first and the labor unions are unsecured, and the automobile dealerships are unsecured. So those are the guys who take it on the chops so first. when we go back to March of 2008, which to me is the most important yeah, that date, was the, that was the, the, the Bear Stearns. Yeah. It's Bear Stearns. So Bear Stearns is uh, not going to be a going concern on Monday morning because they're not going to be able to mm -hmm. get the loans they've been accustomed to getting. Their creditors have decided not to advance more money. They are fundamentally bankrupt, and Bernanke and Paulson – uh, head of the Fed and Treasury Secretary at the time, decide that this is going to have systemic, so-called systemic consequences. And the argument, as I understand it, and listeners here have heard me make it now many times, but I want to get Richard Epstein's take on it. Yeah. The standard argument was, well, you know, they've got so many counterparties. They have so many de contracts that thousands, so maybe millions, so that when you put them into bankruptcy court, all their counterparties are going to be thrown up in the air and the whole system's going to grind to a halt. That was the claim that justified what was an unprecedented uh, maneuver on the part of the Fed to broker a marriage between yeah. Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan. Now, Lehman Brothers, they in, left to die. Uh, four months, uh, six months later, were left to die. And some conclude that that was why we really got into a problem. Others, and I'm of course, one of those, or skeptical that that was the cause. John Taylor's written some interesting things yes, showing that, very that, that, good on that may not be, that the standard view is, could be wrong. But, this, but Lehman Brothers has been in bankruptcy now for whatever it is, six months, seven months, excuse me, eight months. And they seem to be, you know, those, their counterparties are going about life in their business. What are your thoughts on whether Bear Stearns could have gone through bankruptcy court and how disruptive might it have been? Well, it's actually a very complicated question because there's one giant government institution in the closet which has to be brought out to understand what was going on. Let me just give you one fact, and I think it's not a stylized fact, but I think it's a true fact. Hmm. Uh, there are two definitions of bankruptcy. One of the definitions is that you cannot meet your obligations as, you, as they accrue in the short run. And if you looked at Bear Stearns, that was not the case of it. It was actually what they call cash flow positive, meaning on a current basis they were actually taking in more money than they paid out. The real question was whether or not the value of their asset pool was sufficient to cover the accumulated liabilities on that. And on that issue, government regulation had a very key role to play, maybe. And there's this huge debate over what is called the fair value or mark-to-market rules. Let me explain what those rules are to the listeners so they can understand what's going on. Uh, banking has never been a completely unregulated business. And what happens is if it turns out that somebody thinks that the amount of assets that you have in reserve are insufficient to cover your liabilities, what they can do is require you to liquidate some of your positions in order to build up your asset base. And if it turns out you're dealing with randomized events uncorrelated with one another in relatively stable markets. When you sell into the market, what happens is the price that you get is independent of the distress that you suffer. So to give you the simple homely example, if you're going into the market to sell because you need the money to pay for an operation on your mother, um, you'll get exactly the same price on your shares as all right, who is selling so that I could reinvest in some other fancy corporation. But the events that you're talking about with Bear Stearns by the time you got to March of 2008 were no longer uncorrelated events. And so what happens is once you announce that a particular bank is going to be subject to these sorts of obligations to liquidate, the price that they're going to get will not be into a randomized market. It will be into a market that knows that if that price is pegged lower than what might be the discounted fair value of the cash receipts, What's going to happen is that um, the entire value of the market will go down. If the market goes down, then somebody else who might have been in a solvent position will have to revalue their portfolio to the latest strike prices that were realized in the Bear sale, and then they could be in trouble. Well, the folks who are going to buy from Bear 
They said, well, I'm not going to buy from Bayer. I'll just wait until the second guy gets bankrupt because then I could get it for even less. And so you get a cascade that runs downhill at a very rapid rate. And the theory of the Bear Stearns arrangement was if you park these assets in government hands, you could escape the mark-to-market downward cycle. And so what happens is the Bear Stearns merger is complicated because there's a huge debate as to whether the fair value rule revealed deep weaknesses inside Bear Stearns that otherwise would have been papered over, or whether or not it was in fact the cause of all its mystery. And I've talked about this issue a number of times in fairly sophisticated financial circles with people who know a lot more about it than I do, and there's a genuine split of opinion as to which of these two scenarios is right. So at that particular point, you can see what the logic is. The counterparties and everybody else are going to be suffering enormously from the government-type situation. If you could arrange the rescue, you stop the downward spiral. And I, they may have been right, because one of the characteristic features of that bailout was that they kept the priorities straight. Remember that the shareholders wiped in Bear no, were they not two wiped bucks. out, but they went from $300 down to 2 and then eventually they got $10 Ten, a yeah. share, which is pretty correct accounting. So my attitude about it was, is as follows. As a transaction, I thought that it made some sense. As a precedent, I thought it would become disastrous because people would stop worrying about the restrictive conditions and start thinking anytime somebody gets in trouble, we start to bail them out. And I think what would have happened is if they had kept to the original model and then decided to re-examine the fair value rules which require this marking to market and then these sales, they might have been able to weather this particular storm. So that's one thing. The second thing, of course, which is, again, a government fault and for which you can't hold bare, is they, they're holding these packets of basically fractional interests in mortgages. And you cannot do two things at the same time. You can't keep the value of those packets high if simultaneously you're giving foreclosure relief to every Tom, Dick, and Harry who can't pay his money. Um, what happens is if you're telling some guys that they don't have to pay, you're telling somebody else that they can't collect. And so at the time that there was a lot of talk about some kind of interim relief on foreclosure, some of which was sort of done on a haphazard way, what that does is have a devastating value on the portfolios of all of these companies and forces them down independent of any kind of other prudence in their evaluation, which again starts to tell you why it's so critical in these markets not to let the government come in and upset the balances between the parties. And we see it right now again. You're trying to revive a mortgage market. The only way to do that is to take the actual losses, i.e. the decline in value of the property, and realize them. And the way you do that is you either have foreclosure or sale in lieu of foreclosure or whatever, and then have the bank sell these properties off quickly to somebody else. Because the one thing we know is that properties in foreclosure with divided ownerships always go to hell in a handbasket. So that when they had the mortgage moratoria program earlier um, last year sometime, it turned out that most of the people who got the delays did not repair their debt. They did not keep the property up. And then last month and the month before, there were these rash of foreclosures that took place, representing all the pent-up demand to get people out of their properties who had been kept there by government decree. Um, mortgage moratoria, as they are called, just screws up, A, the value of the property, and therefore necessarily the value of the market pools on top of it. So the argument that you make in favor of Bear Stearns is, is not the conventional argument that we want to keep people alive. It's that if the government messes them up, the government has some obligation to keep them alive. And the correct first best solution is don't mess anything up. <laughs> and sure. one way to do that is to allow private contracts to specify whether or not you use a mark-to-market rule rather than having that done by direct government regulation. And then that's a very complicated story because some of these private contracts, in fact, were underpowered. That is, they called for a set of committee controls that made it impossible to renegotiate them in good time. And if you don't have a very flexible situation with the counterparties, you can find that the inability to renegotiate puts both sides in an inferior position. And I think most people, when they drafted these contracts, were not thinking about the sustained disaster that came when the contracts as drafted were melded with a very loose money policy, coupled with a very aggressive subsidy policy through Fannie and Freddie Mac 
coupled with this entire complication with the international capital markets coming into the United States, right, China and all the rest of this stuff, making it very difficult to control prices in the United States simply by controlling domestic money supply. So, I mean, there are a lot of things going yeah. on. Well, let me – we're out of time. Almost out of time. Let me close with a more philosophical question. I was telling my 14-year-old son about uh, Roosevelt's packing of the court. Yes. And – um, he's made my son's made an appearance on the show a couple times. Uh, How old is he? Well, now he's fourteen. But when he, when he was ten, I may have mentioned this on the year before. But when he was ten, and I told him that you couldn't build an apartment uh, building in our, in your backyard, he was shocked. He said, "In America?" And I think I've told this story on air before. But so my son has a a strong interest, belief, and faith in the rule of law and property rights. So when I told him that Roosevelt tried to pack the court, he was a little bit stunned, as I think many people are when they first hear this incident. And then, of course, it's even more depressing when you look at the subsequent behavior of the court, which was to tolerate things that it had mm -hmm. said before was inappropriate. Yeah. So my, my next – my closing question also comes from a listener, John Popola, who asks what might check the power of the state in the face – of the apparent indifference to the moves that have been made so far. Uh, normal answer would be, well, the Constitution. I'm not very optimistic about that. And do you have any optimism? And let me phrase it, the question even in a, a different way, which is, you, know, you could just say, well, okay, we're going through a bad time, as we did during the Great Depression, and, you know, the government's going to have more power to do a bunch of horrible stuff, like they do in war and, yeah. and in, in economic downturns like this. But now, when it's over, we'll go back to, quote, the old days, more or less. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, let's just start with the court packing thing. Um, it's important that everybody understand why it was that what Roosevelt did did not violate any law. All it says is that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress shall ordain and establish. It doesn't tell you the size of the court. Nine was by convention, not by requirements. So adding on additional justices essentially violates the political norm by giving too much power to one administration vis-a-vis -vis the other. And the last thing you want is 19 justices on a court and then have to decide whether they all have to sit on bunk every time in order for it to be one court. So what Roosevelt did was he violated a set of sort of sub-constitutional customary norms, and there was a very powerful reaction against that. Part of it was capitulation, I think, but part of it actually was resistance. Um, what really made the difference in these cases was also that everybody saw the writing on the wall in 1937. They knew that there would be retirements either that year or the next year, and that Roosevelt would get to give the new appointments, and that all these 5-4 presidents would turn over anyhow. And so what happened is Justice Hughes, who always thought of himself as something of a statesman and was, governor of New York, presidential nominee, head of the American Bar Foundation, founder of Hughes Hubbard, Reed and Blair, he basically changed his tune. And Justice Roberts did the same thing. And I don't know exactly what their influences were, uh, but it's quite clear that they probably regarded this as the country demands it, how can the court stand in their way? And they thought of it as a response to the overwhelming Roosevelt victory in 1936, rather than some kind of abject capitulation. Yeah, they would have been very comfortable in uh, in the Weimar Republic as well. Yeah, I mean, what I a mean, strange, it's, that's a very disappointing attitude. In well, a, my in view about it is if there's a constitution, you enforce it, and if democratic processes don't like it, then let them go through the amendments. But yeah. you don't make the way to something unless you believe that they're correct on the law, and they were not correct on the law, in my judgment. All right, well, the question for the modern situation is, is it's, let me put it in the simplest fashion is what we believe is that with separation of powers and checks and balances, um, one branch of government cannot take over everything. The other two are kind of checks against it. The problem that we are facing now is that there is a surprising concordance of opinion amongst all three branches of governments about the desirability of policies that I regard as completely unwise and indefensible. And what happens is when you get that kind of unanimity, you can't get a system of checks and balances. Now, what's going to be necessary to change this thing? Well, one of them is 40 real Republican votes in the Senate, which may include some blue dog Democrats to slow some of this stuff down. But I think that what you have to do is to have people think long and hard about the implications of what's done in order to expose 
um, what I think to be the disastrous policies on economic issues of an administration which has absolutely wonderful public relations skills. And that's the great difficulty. Following the same policies, by the way, to a large extent, that its predecessor did with horrible public relations skills, but they seem to have... Oh, that's true on the on the international foreign affairs, national security and, stuff. And the financial, and the the, the way we're treating the well, banks. I think it's, it's, he's, what he's done is he's taken, he's gone Bush prime. He's gone one step further. Bush at least had the rationale, I'm not going to do anything because there's an elected president who has to take off. My view about it is he's president until January 20th, and if he thinks that General Motors should not receive a short-term infusion of cash, you don't give it. And he saves Obama a very serious problem. Yeah. Or removes from him a very thinking, dangerous I'm thinking about, opportunity. I'm thinking about the TARP funds. Of the TARP funds, yes. Well, they appropriated them, and then the, the next Congress expands them and so forth. Now, of course, we understand how difficult it is to deliver them. There are all sorts of uncertainties as to who gets it, how they're to be spent, when they can be returned. Uh, there's some talk that the banks aren't allowed to return the TARP money because that removes one layer of government control over them. It's been a fiasco, and it's only going to get worse. And, and let me end on this sentence. One of the ways in which to understand the rule of law in its robust sense is that property rights should not be indefinite because that opens the sphere to political intrigue. When you weaken the takings clause, when you see an aggressive interjection of the president and the Congress into commercial affairs, you have a constitutional framework and political actors who make property rights as indefinite as they could possibly be. And in the long term, everybody will lose, even if in the short term, one or another people will say, gee, didn't I really win big today? Those short-term losses will be wiped out in the long-term general decline. My guest today has been Richard Epstein of the University of Chicago and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Richard, thanks, as always, for being My part pleasure. of Econ Talk. I take care. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.